And so many women, I mean, mostly women, I guess, suffering from thyroid issues. And, and, and that could be questioned why. Yeah, well, definitely. We know that the, the genes that I talked about, as far as those that affect iodine metabolism, they're primarily X-linked genes. Mm. So women get two sets of those. And if there are any things on the X-linked genes that are problematic, they're just twice as apt to have them manifest as men are. So that's that's one big factor. Okay. And uh, so since we know that there could be profound changes after restricting iodine intake and, um, and, and you think three months should be enough to reset the iodine function, correct? In most cases. And so the best analogy I've thought of is this is like the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, it's not that the straw was bad per se. There was just one, there was just a little bit too much of it. And also to use this analogy, imagine that you wanted to let the camel heal. You know, you couldn't take one straw off and expect the camels back to heal, right? <laughs> You've got to like unload it for a while. So that's that's the same thing. If you can get below a certain threshold, this free radical damage is low enough the thyroid gland can often heal itself. So what are the strategies to get people to reduce the toxic load? You know, a simple thing, it's identifying the big sources and just cutting out the main ones. Again, everything has some, so you can't get to zero and you don't want to. But if you get mm. the big outliers away, then you do a lot better. There's some things that have a lot, but not many people consume them. And there's other things that have not quite as much, but everyone eats too much of. And so mm -hmm. the, the, and there's also then to refer to that, there's some foods to where their content has changed over the same time frame over these last several decades. So the biggest culprits that fit all three of those criteria would be processed grains and dairy products. Mm -hmm. These are things that a lot of folks consume. They consume more of those, especially more processed grains over the last few decades. And the amount of iodine in those foods has increased. So those are two big relevant how did, categories. Did, how did iodine get into the grains? Yeah, so not in grains directly, but in commercial processing. And it's honestly, it's a bit of a mystery. So on one hand, you can see labeled products that will say containing iodized dough conditioners, but that's not a perfect exclusionary criteria. You know, some studies would assay commercial breads and differentiate them based on whether they had any listed iodine ingredients or not that didn't predict their iodine status. So there are things that end up in processed foods that do not become part of the ingredient list. That's a, that's a known fact. And there are ways iodine can be used in processing grain products. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's a strange idea. So, uh, so the dairy, I assume is, I, I think I, um, it may be related to using iodine to clean the, the udder. Of the mm -hmm. cow. Exactly. That's one big source. Another one is there are some feeds that are fortified with iodine. And the third one is a lot of cows are given fish meal as a cheap protein source. And that ends up, and they concentrate that iodine pretty badly. So, yeah, mm. those three things can cause the iodine content in milk to be really pronounced. Actually, funny thing, but I mentioned how thyroid disease picked up in the US around the time of iodine fortification. In the UK, it picked up nearly as much. They didn't fortify with iodine, but they did fortify their their cow feed with iodine around that same time. Mm, wow. Okay. So, so people would not have imagined that um, the processed grains and dairy would be in a, a good big source of iodine. So, so these are the things you consider as low amount of iodine, but people consume a lot of, correct? Well, not a low amount. There are moderate amounts. Sometimes they're actually a high amount. So the mm. highest sources would be things like sea vegetables. Many mm. don't consume them. Some do, but they have just massive amounts. But yeah, overall dairy and grains are the food categories in which the amount of intake of those categories has increased and the iodine in those foods has increased. I see. So sea vegetables... Um, but but would you suspect that the Japanese population, since they're the best known for eating probably the most amount of seaweed right. in the world, right? Are they for high sure. in their thyroid issues? So what, what do we call autoimmune thyroiditis? Mm -hmm. What's the name for that? Chronic oh. lymphocytic thyroiditis? Uh, Hashimoto's. <laughs> <laughs> it's not O'Malley's disease. It's not... <laughs> It's not Ortega's okay. disease. So they realize, so <laughs> no, the Hashimoto realized it's a problem. <laughs> the Japanese have the highest rates of all versions of thyroid disease. You know, they've got okay. a lot of good health in many ways, but it's not a coincidence that it was a brilliant Japanese doctor that first worked out how this whole thing happened. But he didn't know it had to do with seaweed. <laughs> um, not yet, but soon after that has been back pretty well. And many areas that have the highest intake have the highest rates of thyroid disease. Wow. And That's even nice. one one more wrinkle, many then say, well, what about the Japanese iodine breast cancer and all that breast health? So within Japanese, those with the highest iodine excretion 
are the ones most prone to develop breast cancer. So, so yeah, they do consume a lot. They have a lot of good things going for their health, but the iodine is not helping them. Mm, okay. Amazing. Um, so do you feel like these are the biggest sources of iodine in, in our diet or? Well, is- so it's, it's, it's all, it's cumulative, right? Those are the ones that have changed a lot. So, so those two, not, not everyone eats seaweed. Those who do, there's a lot of iodine there. Iodized salt is another big source mm-hmm. and there's iodine added to salt, but a lot of popular salts have massive amounts of naturally occurring iodine. Mm-hmm. So uh, pink Himalayan salt, some assays have shown that per serving it has twice the iodine is iodized salt and often surprises people. Oh, Some the Himalayan versions. salt has mm-hmm. twice amount. Okay, wow. Yeah, assays have been inconsistent, but some have shown that it has twice the amount of iodized, iodine fortified salt. Wow. So that okay. can be a big source. Um, uh-huh. Egg yolks can have a fair amount. Uh, seafood, that's the one that bothers me the most because there's so much data about the benefit of seafood. Thankfully, yeah. there are versions that are lower in iodine. And then also we think about um, uh, cosmetic products. So yeah, things we put on the skin. Iodine is a useful chemical, just like bleach and peroxide are, you know, so it makes in making a, like a conditioner, for example, it makes it stay smooth and not separate out and not get rancid quickly, but Ooh. we absorb some of that. Uh, it was in hand sanitizers that was taken out in 2018 by the FDA when it was Ooh. found that so many hospital workers were being exposed to unsafe amounts of iodine from frequent use, but oh. we still have it in quite a few personal care products. Uh, conditioners, face creams, body lotions, you know, conventional products primarily call it PVP or related names, polyvinyl pyridone, natural Mm. products call it sea vegetable extract or kelp extract or things along those lines, Mm. but it's iodine and we absorb a bunch of it. I see. Okay. So reading the labels, um, that's, um, that's concerning sea vegetable extract. I mean, that sounds so healthy and lovely, um, but if you're well, trying to flush out the iodine, that's something. Well, to- so I've run the math on this and the typical amount of, of PVP used in a conditioner, the same thing as a sea extract, it's about one to 2%. So it's not like the whole bottle, mm-hmm. but that compound is about 14% iodine by weight and healthy skin will absorb about 4% of iodine when it's held in contact. So the things we put on us and we leave on, we can absorb some of that. So when you run all the math on that, I, I, I worked this out one time and I grabbed my wife's conditioner bottle and I, you know, he took the recommended amount and I weighed that and it was like, it was 20 grams, so like 20 million micrograms, right? So you, you do all those percentages and we're talking about micrograms being relevant. And what you walk away with is about 10 days, 10 times one day's safe upper limit exposure to iodine.